Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Adriana Link, and I am the Assistant Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Uh, welcome to today's virtual discussion with Rachel E. Walker on her new book, uh, Beauty and the Brain, The Science of Human Nature in Early America. Uh, we're really glad that so many of you have decided to join us today uh, for this conversation. I'd like to begin uh, by recognizing that the American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose ancestral relationships and connections with this land continue to this day and into the future. The APS wishes to express its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals uh, throughout the continent who have offered guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration that help make the work of the society possible. For those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 to support the promotion of useful knowledge. Election to APS membership honors those who have made significant contributions to sciences, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over one and a half million dollars in research grants a year uh, to individuals who are working on projects spanning the arts, sciences, and humanities. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. So please check out our website, uh, www.anfilsoft.org, uh, to learn about who we are and all the things that we do. Today's program complements the APS Museum's current exhibition, Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science, which explores how women scientists have overcome obstacles to achieve breakthroughs, make places for themselves in science, and help others along the way. For more information on our hours and how to visit us, uh, please also check out our website uh, for that information. This afternoon's event is also the first in a full slate of fall programs exploring the topic of women in science. And I encourage you to consider joining us again tomorrow night at 6 p.m. for an in-person lecture with Pulitzer Prize winning author Kate Zernicki on her book, The Exceptions, Nancy Hopkins, MIT, and the Fight for Women in Science. Uh, again, as with all our things, uh, more information about how to attend the event in person as well as to access the live stream may be found on our website. Uh, in the meantime, I am very delighted to welcome uh, Rachel Walker to our virtual stage. And as you've no doubt gathered, uh, today's program is being hosted on Zoom webinar. So if you have a question, uh, I encourage you to please use the Q&A button uh, at the bottom center of your navigation bar. Uh, you can type your question in there at any time during our conversation, and we will have time at the end um, to consider all of the questions from you with our speaker. A closed captioning uh, is also available by clicking on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom, which is to the right of the Q&A button. So with that, I am very pleased uh, to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Rachel E. Walker is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Hartford, uh, where she teaches courses on race, gender, and sexuality in America. Her first book, which is the topic of today's conversation, Beauty in the Brain, The Science of Human Nature in Early America, uh, was recently published with the University of Chicago Press and was the winner of the Mary Kelly Best Book Prize from the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, uh, as well as a finalist for the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize sponsored by the Organization of American Historians. Her work has been generously supported by numerous archives and instance, uh, institutions throughout Philadelphia uh, and the country, including the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, the Smithsonian Institution, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Antiquarian Society, the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine, and of course, the American Philosophical Society. And uh, we'll include some information in the chat on how to purchase uh, Rachel's book. And uh, for those of you who are interested, there is a 30% uh, off discount code uh, for the book. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Rachel and uh, thank you all. I'm so excited to hear this presentation. All right, I am going to share my screen. Let's 
All right. I uh, I wanted to start by just saying thank you uh, to the American Philosophical Society for welcoming, welcoming me to give this talk um, as part of the Women in Science series. And also thanks in particular to Adriana, who's been um, a great intermediary um, between the research department at APS um, and me. Um, so I'm really, really grateful to the American Philosophical Society, not just for inviting me today, but also for funding my work in the past, uh, which is so vital. I mean, the APS provided so many of the manuscripts scripts that serve as the foundation for this book, especially the fifth chapter of my book, which I won't even be talking about today at all. Um, but the APS has a whole bunch of um, early penitentiary records uh, that served as kind of the basis for a chapter on physiognomy, phrenology, and prisons in the early American Republic. Um, but I'm also just grateful for the, the time and the funds uh, that the APS gave me to, to work on this project in the first place. So thanks for welcoming me. Um, as Adriana said, my book is entitled Beauty and the Brain, the Science of Human Nature in Early America. Uh, this is an early history of psychology in the United States. Uh, it's a history of psychology before psychology formally existed as a discipline. Um, so instead of studying psychology, I focus on two disciplines that were once enormously popular, but have now been largely forgotten, except by uh, mostly literary scholars, art historians, and historians of science. And um, these disciplines were physiology and phrenology. So if you know something about early American history, you might know uh, what physiognomy and phrenology are. Um, if not, you're probably wondering what are those sciences in the first place? So physiognomy is actually a really long-standing science that has existed for hundreds of years, stretches back to at least the ancient Greeks. It's basically just rooted on this deceptively simple idea that you can tell something about a person's character, intelligence, or personality by analyzing their facial features. So um, this is kind of, it, it exists in, in almost the realm of, um, astrology or necromancy uh, for, for hundreds of years. But in the 1770s, there's a Swiss reverend named Johann Caspar Lavater, who um, he publishes a four volume treatise on physiognomy in German. This is in the 1770s. And what makes his treatises different than uh, works that had existed on physiognomy before is that he argues that physiognomy is not just an art or a way of decoding people's faces. Physiognomy could actually be a legitimate science that you could attain almost mathematical certainty. So he kind of publishes these books with the idea that he is gonna make the art and science of face reading accessible to the public. They become massive bestsellers. Um, they are essentially like the Twilight books of the late 18th century. They are quickly translated into multiple languages uh, and circulated all throughout Europe and all throughout the world. Uh, and then in the early decades of the 19th century, phrenology emerges. Phrenology in many ways is a discipline that builds off of the assumptions of physiognomy, which is um, the idea that like your head and face can reveal something deeper about your inner nature. Um, but phrenology is a little different than physiognomy in two ways. The first way is that um, rather than just analyzing your facial features, phrenology says that your brain is the organ of your mind and the brain is divided up into a bunch of mini organs. And so different parts of your brain reveal different parts of your personality. So phrenologists, for instance, build on the physiognomic idea that the front part of your brain and thus your forehead uh, reveals something about how smart you are. You might have heard the phrase highbrow, lowbrow, probably. Um, this is a phrase that actually comes from physiognomy and phrenology because physiognomists and phrenologists believed that because the front part of your brain was associated with intellect, if you had a larger forehead, it actually meant you were more intelligent than the broader population. So they used brow and forehead kind of interchangeably. And so they would say, if you had a high brow, then that meant that you were intelligent. Um, phrenologists also argue that the top part of your brain is associated with kind of your moral and spiritual traits, whereas the back part of your brain and the sides of your head are more associated with your animal propensities. Um, so the back part of your brain, for instance, might indicate how much you love to eat if you're um, inclined toward gluttony, or um, the back part of your brain supposedly indicates your animalistic desire for sex. So phrenologists believe that you could measure someone's, um, the strength of someone's libido by analyzing the back of their head, for instance. Um, so phrenology also differs from physiognomy in that phrenologists are trying to be more systematic than the physiognomy. The physiognomists are kind of just like looking at faces and trying to come up with some general rules for what certain facial features mean. So they they argue, for instance, that like a pointy nose might mean that you're stingy or 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 not generous. 
but the phrenologists try to make this more systematic by dividing the brain into pieces. Um, and so the phrenologists are really focusing on the brain. They think the brain is such a powerful organ that it not only reveals your personality, but it also will grow. Like as you become smarter, the front part of your brain will grow bigger and then press on your forehead, press on your skull from the inside out and quite literally shape the um the contours of your cranium um by so you can work on certain parts of your brain and and, and in the process make those parts of your cranium more beautiful so these sciences became enormously popular in the late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, they enraptured people because they promised to demystify human psychology and behavior. They suggested that a person's worth was not just measurable, but also actually visible on the human body, and that heads, faces, and personalities might be read as easily as a book. Since then, we've largely either forgotten about these disciplines entirely. You might be familiar with phrenology. Physiognomy tends to be a little bit more obscure. Um, so we've either kind of forgotten about these sciences or we've dismissed them as quirky and misguided pseudosciences. When people talk about phrenology in particular today, they often do so with a rather dismissive tone. I'm including this image here. It's the cover of a book um, edited by Allison B. Kaufman and James C. Kaufman with MIT Press. Um, and it's a book about pseudoscience and how harmful pseudoscience is. You can see by the, um, the cover of the book, it's called Pseudoscience, The Conspiracy Against Science. It kind of like associates this nefarious intent um, to pseudoscience. And as you can see, the quintessential example that they use on their cover is the phrenology bust. Um, so they argue that phrenology is a pseudoscience and not just a pseudoscience, but the quintessential pseudoscience. So oftentimes we're looking back at physiognomy and phrenology and we're like, how could these people be so stupid? Like, how could they believe that your head and your face and the shape of your cranium and the contours of your skull reveal something deeper about who you are as a person? Um, but in my project, I actually argue that that's a problem because even though we don't think of physiognomy and phrenology as real sciences, early Americans did. And so I argue that we need to take these sciences seriously, not because I think that they are in fact legitimate technologies for analyzing character and personality, um, but because early Americans believed that they were. And because early Americans thought that these sciences revealed such important information about human character, personality, and behavior, I think that if we actually want to understand the people that we're studying and, and place ourselves within their cultural and intellectual universe, then we've got to take those disciplines seriously too, because they did. They um, saw them as very serious social practices, intellectual philosophies, and scientific disciplines. That's not to say that they were universally accepted and that people didn't challenge them, but it is to say that they did not think of them as silly pseudosciences in the way that we might today. So calling them silly pseudosciences, it might make us feel really good about ourselves because it makes us feel smarter and better than people in the past, but I don't think it's very intellectually useful. So that's kind of one of the main goals of this book is to make people rethink the meaning of science and, and what counted as science in early America. Um, but I'm also trying to add answer a big question that has consumed historians for decades. Um, and so the major question animating this book is actually a question about science, inequality, and power. The question is, how did Americans make sense of inequality while living in a country where technically it wasn't supposed to exist? And how did they use science to do so? After all, the United States is supposed to be this country that is dedicated to principles like liberty, equality, justice, freedom, uh, but the United States is also a very unequal country, and it has been an unequal country since its founding. So in this project, I'm trying to figure out, like, how did people use science to rationalize the disjuncture between what they said they believed in, which is equality and liberty and justice, and the very real reality of inequality and injustice in their society. How do they use science to rationalize that? Um, so on the one hand, I show how people use physiognomy and phrenology to make sense of inequality by saying like, certain people like Benjamin Franklin or George Washington are simply better 
They have better brains. They have better bodies. They are anatomically and physiologically suited to be the leaders of the early American Republic. Um, they are these kind of superior specimens of humanity that are uniquely suited to have rights and privileges that other people don't have um, because they just happen to be smarter and better than everyone else. So on the one hand, my project does something really basis, basic. Um, it shows how the privileged and powerful have historically used science to rationalize, justify, and enforce inequality. Um, but I think that my project also does something a little bit more uh, interesting and, and sophisticated than that. I don't just show how the privileged and powerful use science to justify inequality. Um, I also show how science can be not just a weapon of oppression, but a tool of liberation. So let me give you some examples. Um, in my project, I kept discovering something over and over and over again in the archives. You know, it's very easy to think about physiognomy and phrenology as these racist, sexist, and classist disciplines that justify inequality. Um, but I kept finding examples of marginalized people and social radicals and progressive activists who are embracing physiognomy and phrenology and viewing them as not just legitimate, but also helpful, useful, and potentially liberatory sciences. Um, this includes people like Frederick Douglass. Uh, Frederick Douglass was very, very suspicious of white scientists and for good reason. Um, Frederick Douglass knew that white scientists would justify African-American inequality and justify slavery by saying that African-Americans were simply just anatomically and physi uh, physiologically inferior to white Americans. And yet, Frederick Douglass did believe that there were some white scientists um, that kind of had a more ethical understanding of, of human nature. And one of those scientists that he thought actually kind of gave African-Americans a scientific way of understanding their own identities was George Coombe, who was one of the most famous phrenologists in the world. Um, Frederick Douglass also repeatedly used physiognomic and phrenological language when talking about Black Americans um, in an attempt to show that like maybe white Americans are simply reading heads and faces incorrectly. And if only he could find a more ethical alternative, a, a more ethical way of reading heads and faces, um, then physiognomy and phrenology and science more generally might be used to advocate for equality. Frederick Douglass is not alone. Um, there are also people like William Lloyd Garrison and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott and Abby Kelly Foster. All of these people are abolitionists and women's rights activists who don't see physiognomy and phrenology as a problem that as problematic disciplines, but actually see them as liberatory tools that might be used to advocate for equity. So I kept finding this in the archive. I'm like, all of these social radicals and, and activists who are using these disciplines, I wanted to know why, because these sciences, as I said, are very obviously used to justify scientific racism, um, ethnic discrimination, classism, sexism. And yet I kept finding all these examples of people who were embracing them. So I wanted to know why marginalized people and social reformers embrace these disciplines because they are so transparently inequitable and dangerous. Um, so what did make them appealing to ordinary people and especially to people who thought of themselves as social progressives or radicals or reformers? Today, I want to kind of gesture towards those questions and hopefully answer them, but totally happy to talk about it more in the question and answer. Um, but uh, first, I just wanted to give you a couple examples of how Americans used physiognomy and phrenology to justify oppression. Um, and then going on the kind of women in science theme, I picked out a few examples of women um, who use physiognomy and phrenology as, um, as a way of kind of understanding their own identities and evaluating others. Um, and, and women who, who see these sciences not as dangerous disciplines, but potentially as useful tools for understanding their world. So on the one hand, um, there in the 19th century, people are justifying political inequality by holding up certain white male political leaders as superior specimens of humanity whose craniums and facial features indicate their greatness. It might not seem like it um, by modern beauty standards, but these two men, Daniel Webster and John C. Calhoun, they were repeatedly held up as, um, as 
as physiognomic exemplars, as people who um, would be able to demonstrate um, what an ideal head or face looked like. Um, and so people repeatedly described in, in periodicals, in newspapers, in political pamphlets, in novels, they would describe white male political leaders as paragons of physiognomic and phrenological excellence. They'd point to their large heads. As you can see here, Daniel Webster has like an almost, this portrait, he's drawn with almost comically large head. He did have a very big head, but um, an almost comically large head and a very exaggerated forehead because a forehead was supposed to indicate your intellectual ability. Very dark brows that indicate the serious nature of his intellectual capacity. Um, John C. Calhoun was often elevated as an example of firmness, as someone who would stick to their positions and, and be able to defend them. Um, within the, the political arena, they saw these men's expansive foreheads, their big heads, their penetrating eyes as a way of showing that these men deserved political leadership. It's this idea that like your external features are um, a reflection of your internal mind. And because these men's heads and faces were impressive, it was somehow a sign that they were suited for um, political leadership. It probably comes as no surprise after everything that I've said that um, physiognomy and phrenology serve as a foundation for scientific racism, for biological determinism, which is essentially the idea that like you are burnt, born into a particular brain and body and there's nothing that you can do to change it. Um, and also eventually eugenics. A lot of the eugenicists of the early 20th century are actually just recycling a lot of older physiognomic and phrenological ideas. Americans also used physiognomy and phrenology to craft ethnic hierarchies. Um, so here's an example from a physiognomical book um, in, in the mid 19th century. Um, they give two examples. One is Florence Nightingale, who's a British reformer and nurse who is very um, influential and famous in the 19th century. And the other is just this fictional character called Bridget McBruiser. They're making fun of the Irish and, and portraying them as almost animalistic. You can probably see for yourself um, how they portray these women's faces in different ways. Florence Nightingale is portrayed in this very delicate and beautiful way. Um, and Bridget McBruiser almost looks like a 19th century version of the Grinch who stole Christmas, right? Um, again, she's a fictional woman. She's just meant to stand in as a stereotype for Irish women generally. Um, the uh, uh, For Florence Nightingale, the physiognomical treatise described her as bright, intellectual, and spiritual. Um, whereas they described Bridget McBruiser as opaque, dull, and sensual. McBruiser, according to this physiognomist, <laughs> lives in the basement mentally as well as bodily and was governed by her lower or animal passions. Um, this is like the rhetoric of using lower or animalistic passions to describe people is one that is very common to um, phrenological discourses in, in the mid 19th century. I also pulled out this example. Uh, this is actually from the 1890s, but I, I pulled it out because I thought the imagery was so um, powerful um, and, and it kind of exaggerates the messages that were circulating already in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Here you can see um, uh, an image that compares two women and it asks which of these women is domestic. You can see that their, their facial features and their skulls are drawn in drastically different ways. The first one is supposed to represent the typical mother and model wife. Her life is devoted to her husband and children. She's not intellectually good or great, but she is good, which compensates for her lack of wisdom, supposedly. So she's not necessarily the smartest person in the world, but she is, um, she is very good and she'll make it a good wife. They're a lot harsher, the phrenologists, when describing cut number two. <laughs> they say, uh, children and birds are instinctively repelled from a woman of this description, while the most ardent man would be chilled to ice in her presence. She is a stranger to love and sentiment, a woman of dry facts who is devoted to selfish gain. They say her features are sharp, indicating keenness of selfish intellect. If she should succeed in inveigling a poor white into marriage, they write, his life would be beset with thorns and his ears regaled with nightly curtain lectures. By that, they mean that this woman is basically going to harass him and lecture him and think of herself as intellectually superior to her husband and that she's a woman that even children and birds know instinctively to run away from because she's so ugly and her facial features and her skull shape reveal her incapacity for domestic work. 
So this brings you back to like the larger question, which is like, there are all these examples. I can, I could say hundreds of newspaper articles, periodic um, newspaper articles and magazine articles and novels and books and all of these sources from the early 19th century, all these examples where physiognomy and phrenology are being used essentially to justify oppression and discrimination. So why is it that um, all of these activists like William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass and um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and all of these other people who are embracing physiognomy and phrenology, like what actually makes it appealing to them? So I wanted to give an example of Elizabeth Cady Stanton just to show perhaps one of the reasons why it was appealing to her. Elizabeth Cady Stanton often railed against white male scientists because she said, including phrenologists, by the way, um, because she said that they described women as intellectually inferior beings. And she felt very strongly that women were not intellectually inferior by nature and that she in particular uh, was not intellectually inferior. Um, so she described her enlightenment um, and she said that phrenology was a science that showed her, quote, a way out of the darkness into the clear sunlight of truth. She compares science and religion, arguing that she's kind of paralyzed by um, the what she calls the intellectual labyrinth of religion. She says, my religious superstitions gave place to rational ideas after she reads um, a bunch of phrenological treatises, um, rational ideas based on scientific facts. And in proportion, as I looked at everything from a new standpoint, I grew more and more happy day by day. So for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she views science, and in this case, phrenology, as a discipline that makes people more rational, makes them more sophisticated, um, and gives her a way out of religious superstition. But she also saw phrenology as a discipline that might eventually prove the intellectual equality of, of the sexes. Um, because according to phrenological discourses, male brains and female brains were essentially similar. They had all of the same organs. They might have them in different proportions, but every individual could be phrenologically unique. And so for Elizabeth Cady Stanton, when she got her head read by a phrenologist, it kind of confirmed what she already thought she knew about herself, which is that she was strong and she was um, intellectually capable and she was veering into genius, just like a lot of her male counterparts. And so for her, phrenology was this validating discipline, not just a discipline that allowed her to see the truth of rational observation, but also a discipline that might prove that, in fact, she was just as smart as men after all. But why did other women embrace these sciences and how did they use phrenology for their own ends? I've come up with what I think are a few big reasons for why these sciences appealed to women. The first is that physiognomy and phrenology were both ubiquitous and accessible. This was a time when college and colleges and medical schools were generally inaccessible to women, um, but physiognomy and phrenology were disciplines that didn't have to be accessed in college. You could learn about them in people's homes. You could just buy a phrenological treatise and read it, um, or a physiognomical treatise and read it. You could talk about it with your friends. You could learn about it on the streets. You could learn about it in public lectures. Phrenologists and physiognomists often traveled from place to place, sharing scientific knowledge and selling scientific material as they went. You could also get a personalized reading from a physiognomist or a phrenologist. Um, you could go to a phrenological workshop. You could learn about it at a dinner party. You could learn about it in novels, in newspapers, in magazines. These sciences are essentially everywhere in the early decades of the 19th century. And so if you want scientific knowledge, you have it at your fingertips as long as you can read and write. But it's not just that. Phrenologists are also actively marketing their science to female users. And in fact, sometimes phrenologists and physiognomists say that women are the ideal practitioners because um, women, it's more important to get phrenological knowledge into the hands of children and to raise children properly um, according to good scientific principles. Um, and so phrenologists often argue that women are the most important because um, women are the ones who are doing most of the child rearing. And so women have to understand phrenology if they wanna understand how to raise their children properly. But um, phrenology and physiognomy also appealed to women because women saw them as like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as rational sciences. Um, and if they see them as rational sciences, then they think of physiognomy and phrenology um, 
if they can exhibit mastery in these realms, then they can use that as a symbol of their own intellectual refinement. I'm gonna give you just a few examples um, to back up my point here. So um, this is a letter from a woman named Anna Breed to a famous abolitionist and women's rights activist, um, Abby Kelly. She's talking about the fact that she feels kind of intellectually stilted um, by living in Lynn, Massachusetts. She thinks of it as kind of like a backwater. It's not like Boston. It's not like Philadelphia. It's not like New York. It's a place where people don't talk about intellectual subjects. And, and she views herself as an intellectual. But she has this one night where she gathers with a bunch of women and men, and they actually have what she considers to be sophisticated intellectual discussions. And so she's writing about this night that she she found really invigorating. She said, what did we talk? Not about pretty babies, nor new gowns and caps. Um, so this is like frivolous subjects that she typically associates with other women. She sees herself as superior um, to other women. And she says it's possible. And in Lynn, too. Our principal subjects were phrenology, physiology, physiognomy, the climate of the self, residence there, J.G. Whittier, who's a famous um, author of the time and his poetry. So for her, discussing physiognomy and phrenology is not frivolous or silly. This is actually intellectually sophisticated and she juxtaposes this scientific and enlightened conversation um, with other more frivolous women who talk about babies and dresses and hats. There's also the example, this is actually from the American uh, Philosoph Philosophical Society, Society Collections um, of a uh, Jewish woman um, in the 1830s writing to her uh, rather famous philanthropist um, aunt. And in the letter, she describes phrenology as her favorite science. And it's clear that Rebecca Gratz and Miriam Cohen um, are having kind of sending letters back and forth about phrenology and about the lecture series of George Coombe, who is one of the most famous phrenologists in the world at this point. Um, so she's discussing the lecture series. She refers to phrenology as her favorite science, but it's also clear that she wants to know about phrenology because it allows her to keep up with her friends and her family members. So she closes the letter. This is after she discusses um, the lecture series early in the letter. She closes the letter by saying, tell Sarah to let me know the title of the book by Combe that she has been reading as I wish to keep up with you all. And she underlines it as much as possible in hopes that I might have an opportunity also of profiting by the lectures in case of a visit from Combe. So she wants to keep up with her friends and family and show that she too can be intellectually sophisticated. And she thinks of doing that by knowing more about phrenology, by attending phrenological lectures and by reading phrenological treatises. There's also an example of a black woman who started her life as an enslaved woman. Um, she actually um, was enslaved by the brother of Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy. So um, she, despite being enslaved, was very highly educated. Um, and after she attains her freedom, she's able to further her studies as far as she wants. She ends up going to Oberlin College. So um, Mary Virginia Montgomery, she is reading the American Phrenological Journal. She has a subscription to the American Phrenological Journal. She owns her own phrenological bust so that she can practice the science of, of skull reading. Um, but she's not just reading about phrenology. She's reading about chemistry. She's reading um, Darwin's Origin of the Species, for instance. Um, and she's reading all of these books alongside one another. So for her, phrenology can be this kind of serious intellectual pursuit. Um, but phrenology is also something that she views as instructive and amusing. Um, when she goes away to college, um, she writes about how she brings her phrenological journal with her um, and she practices reading heads while she's on, on the ship. Uh, and she says, I tried to entertain phrenologically and had a lively time. I don't feel homesickness so much now. So for her, phrenology is also kind of this comforting social activity that brings her in contact with other people um, and allows her to overcome her feelings of, of homesickness when she goes to college. So I give you all of these examples, but you're probably wondering like, why in the world would a black woman of the time embrace phrenology? Um, and in part, I think it's because of a few reasons. So even though phrenologists wrote a lot of very racist things about black Americans, 
They also occasionally published really flattering profiles of them. Um, the American Phrenological Journal, for instance, described a Black woman who was a captive on the Amistad, which is the, the ship of, um, of enslaved people who fought for their freedom and, and attained it, as having independence, perseverance, energy, and unusual intellectual powers. They described her forehead as broad and high and particularly prominent in the center and said that the whole head was large and sustained by a vigorous constitution. These are really complimentary words for a Black woman, which is not common at the time for scientists to praise Black Americans for their intelligence. Even so, they describe her as basically being far superior to other Africans, um, holding her up as an exception that proves their racist rule. So for Black women, there is encouragement in phrenological discourses, even as there is racism and discrimination. But it's not hard for me to see how like one of the only scientific publications at the time holding up a black woman as a model, right? It's not surprising to me that Mary Virginia Montgomery might latch on to a science like this. American phrenologists were largely um, anti-slavery and they also supported women's rights actually pretty vehemently. Um, they published flattering profiles of women's rights activists um, regularly in their, in their journal. And they also uh, forwarded this kind of flexible interpretation of the human mind and body, which insisted that all human brains were actually equal. They all had the same organs. Um, and they insisted that every single person's brain was capable of improvement, regardless of where you started out in life. Um, still, when early Americans embraced physiognomy and phrenology, that came with risks and drawbacks. Um, so on the one hand, phrenology kind of asserts that everyone can improve their brain and everyone's brain is more similar than different. This is encouraging for Black Americans and for women who are constantly being told that their brains are inferior. Um, but when they when they embrace physiognomy and phrenology, um, they kind of end up validating this idea that external beauty is, in fact, a sign of internal worth. They also essentially concede that human value can be determined by scientific study. And in doing that, they lent credence to discriminatory ideas that ended up laying the scientific foundation for political and social exclusion. I nonetheless think it's important to recover this history of physiognomy and phrenology and the marginalized people who used it. Um, because at the most basic level, it reminds us that science can simultaneously be a weapon of oppression and also a tool of liberation that marginalized people and radical activists can use to fight for racial justice and gender equality. It also reminds us that white men are not actually the only people practicing science in early America. Um, and I also think that if we don't take physiognomy and phrenology seriously, then we're simply not going to be able to understand the people that we study. Um, we won't understand how they comprehended topics like race or gender or intelligence or beauty or science or power, right? Like all of those categories, they used physiognomy and phrenology to understand them. So um, we need to understand these disciplines if we want to understand how they made these abstract concepts feel really real, practical, and meaningful on the ground. Finally, um, I think that the history of physiognomy and phrenology is vitally important because it actually forces us to adopt a posture of intellectual humility. I think it can be really easy to look back at these discarded disciplines and denounce them as absurd, humorous, or dangerous examples of pseudoscientific quackery because it makes us feel smarter or more thoughtful or more scientifically advanced than our predecessors. But when we scoff at disciplines like physiognomy and phrenology, I think it's ultimately just a way of burnishing our own egos. And I don't think that that's particularly useful because the job of a historian is to recover lost worlds, to sit in those worlds, recapture their contours, and try to make people understand what it was like to live and think in a different era. And I know that that can be a difficult pursuit sometimes, especially when we're studying cultural beliefs or moral values that we find reprehensible or alien to us, but I think it's still a valuable pursuit. Um, obviously I'm biased because I wrote a whole book about this topic, but I think that subjects like this are uh, so exciting precisely because they remind me to be humble. They remind me that the definition of science and history is always changing and that culture is always changing and that all of the things that we think of as normal and natural and right and moral, those things will probably change too. Um, so on that note, uh, I want to say that I'm really humbled by all of your interest in, in my work. Um, it's been a real pleasure to share it all with you, and um, I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks.
Awesome. Little lag on the computer. Thank you so much, Rachel. I th that was really quite delightful. And, and I, I would say only a snapshot of the richness that's that's contained in the manuscript itself. So I really would encourage folks. I was saying to Rachel before before the program started that I was actually reading the book during my vacation uh, last weekend. And, and it it holds up as a vacation book as much as a, <laughs> as a kind of critical uh, intellectual study as well. Um, so we have a number of questions already coming in the Q&A, and I would encourage folks uh, uh, to continue to put those in and we'll get as many, to as many as we can uh, in the time that remains. But I guess I wanted to start us off um, with, with a, well, well, first with, again, a, a word of appreciation just for, for the um, the real broad spectrum uh, of uses of phrenology and physiognomy that you, you uh, discuss throughout the book and, and really showing that, that there are moments that, that these, these different spectrums are, are at odds uh, with one another. Um, but I, I was hoping that maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, how, how this came to be distinctly an American uh, pursuit, mm -hmm. uh, because as you point out in the book, you know, the, this isn't unique to the United States. Um, it becomes very popular, but but why? So maybe you could talk a little bit about how it came to be so popular during this period and, and how it sort of uh, becomes a, a science of, 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 of at some point you talk about it as, as reflective of the American dream. Yeah, I mean, so all of these famous uh, physiognomists and phrenologists actually um, start in Europe for the most part. Like that's where these sciences are essentially kind of birthed. Um, but but they become most popular in the United States um, and to a slightly lesser degree in Britain. Um, and I think in part they become so popular in the United States because after the American Revolution, there's this real spirit of like in America you can be anything and go anywhere and you know do whatever you set your mind to right like there's this like meritocratic idea which is obviously false i mean so many scholars have shown that like just because you say that anything is possible in the united states it doesn't mean anything actually is possible um there are structures of racism and sexism um and classism and all and all of these things that stop people from achieving their dreams but at least ideologically, people want to believe that, right? They want to believe that the United States is this land of possibility and that reform is possible and that everyone can improve. Um, and so phrenology as it's practiced, phrenology especially as it's practiced in the United States, is this fundamentally optimistic discipline. It's the idea that like actually everyone can change their brain. Um, so you might be born with a particular brain. Um, you might be born with a low forehead, but perhaps if you study really hard, you know, you can increase the size of your brain in the frontal lobe and that brain can kind of push out on your skull and make your forehead more attractive or make your skull more attractive. Um, and so phrenology kind of has this optimistic messaging that really appeals to Americans who have this meritocratic idea that maybe anyone can be successful so long as you work hard enough. Great. There's so many questions coming in. It's hard. It's hard to hard to think about where to go next. Um, so I'll, I'll go. There's a question from Alyssa Brophy, who's actually at the APS, who, who's talking specifically about uh, arguments that you make in chapter three, uh, mm -hmm. where you examine the ways in which women used physiognomy and phrenology language to describe other people that they encountered. Uh, and in the chapter, you later detail how women utilized facial expressions and incorporated them into their physiognomy physiognomic and phrenolo phrenological readings. I don't know how you say that so smoothly now. Um, so <laughs> when did you, yeah, I bet. Uh, so when did you first realize that this was a trend in your research and how did you begin to look for these descriptions? Mm, okay, so actually the answer to that is that it was basically accidental. So I've always been interested in the history of the human body and like how people quite literally see gender, you know, like when you walk down the street or, or you enter a party, um, how, how do you see gender, right? Um, what what aspects of the human body do you associate with womanhood or, or manhood? Um, and so I was, I knew that that was a topic that I wanted to study, but I didn't know how to study it. And I didn't know like what sort of source base Initially, I was like, okay, so when do people talk about bodies? They talk about bodies when they're punishing bodies. And so initially, this wasn't a project about science at all. It was a project about capital punishment and corporal punishment. Um, and I just, as I was doing that project in like a research seminar a million years ago, um, I kind of accidentally discovered as I just like kept looking at, um, at different publications, pamphlets, newspapers, and magazines from the early national period, I kept discovering these like very detailed descriptions of people's heads and faces. And at first I'm like, why are people focusing so much? Like, this is like a silly little story about Republican womanhood, right? Why are they focusing so much on a person's nose or the shape of their forehead or their eyebrows or, you know, the, the beaming nature of their eyes? 
Um, and then around the same time, I read a book by Christopher Lukasik, um, who, which is called Discerning Characters about physiognomy. And I was like, oh, that's probably what this is. Um, and so I started just searching for certain phrases that I had seen over and over again, um, you know, like high forehead um, or intellectual brow or um, beaming eyes or, you know, um, uh, generous cheeks, right? Uh, and so I started realizing, like, as I was searching in these digital databases for all these phrases, they're showing up everywhere. And so then I was like, okay, well, if they're showing up everywhere in published works, they must be showing up in people's private manuscripts. And so I just basically went digging in women's manuscripts. Yeah. Great. Um, somewhat related question um, about how how in 19th century, um, how phrenology sort of built upon colonial conceptions about uh, what this person is asking, what would have been termed the science of the soul. So uh, I guess taking it back a little bit, a little bit more, uh, can you talk about kind of the, the older legacy and then maybe how that builds into builds a little bit more into early 20th century conceptions of eugenics, like kind of put Draw that through line for us Long a little history, bit. Colonial yeah. period, twentieth century, sure. So the science of the soul. I mean, in the colonial period, honestly, the early versions of physiognomy are a lot more science of solely than like phrenology becomes by the um, early decades of the nineteenth century. There is kind of this. I remember reading this source one time. I'll answer this question through a specific example um, that I was really fascinated with. It was in the, I think, 1780s. And it was a woman, a young woman, um, teenager, who was talking about how one of her close friends had passed away. Um, and she kind of did this like science of the soul type analysis of her friend's um, corpse. Um, and she said, you know, like in in life, you could see that the soul was animating her face and you could see essentially her um, her spiritual qualities emanating from her eyes and her mouth and they, they were anim animating her face in a way. And in death, she didn't have any of that. So like the fact that like her face was no longer as expressive was a sign to this young woman that um, the soul had left her body and, and gone to heaven. Um, so a lot of physiognomic descriptions, particularly in the late 18th century, kind of hang on to that idea that the soul is animating the body. Phrenologists become a little bit more literal and they say like the brain is the organ of the mind, um, but they're careful to defend themselves against being materialists. So they don't wanna um, say, like they don't really, in, uh, it's kind of hard because it's also, it, all, all of it is such intellectual jelly, like it, it, people have different ideas, but um, the phrenologists are more saying like, the the soul and the character and the personality is something that expresses itself through the brain and then the brain expresses itself on the skull so the soul is not material but the soul has material manifestations um by the time you get to the 20th century with eugenics they're much more concerned with just measuring i mean it's not it's not just the head and face with eugenics it is the head and face but um they're also concerned with measuring like arm length and um ang angles of um of of bones and size of feet and like length of fingers i mean eugenicists are measuring everything they they've essentially lost this idea that like the soul or the spirit is what it's what's important and they're totally embracing the kind of materialism that phrenologists insist that they're not um advocating for even as they kind of are that's great. Thank you. I know that's a hard question. If, uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope that that was like somewhat helpful. It's I'm trying to just like go from the 16th century to the 20th. No, it was, it was perfect. Um, fun question from from Tina Irvine, uh, another APS fellow who uh, asks uh, if you could talk a little bit more about her early Americans thought about and assess hair as a way of thinking oh. about human value. Yeah, I mean, so I don't talk, well, I do talk about hairstyles. I don't talk about hair as a sign of human value as much in this project. Um, I think a lot of scholars of race and science have done a lot of fantastic work to show that like people talk about hair, um, for instance, like the differing um, textures and, and structures of, um, of African-American hair um, as like indicating beauty and refinement and softness. Uh, typically it's a, in the 19th century, the language of softness. Um, but the way that I talk about hair um, is less about the hair itself and more about how the hair is styled. Um, so in the uh, 1840s and 1850s in particular, a lot of um, more conservative, gender conservative men at least, begin getting annoyed because they believe that intellectual women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony um, are chopping off the chopping off their hairlines, like shaving the tops of their heads <laughs> um, in order to make their foreheads look 
larger because if their foreheads look larger, then they'll be seen as more intelligent. And so a lot of critics call this the manly brow movement, um, this idea that like intellectual women are trying to look too intellectual and making themselves look stupid in the process. Um, and so my whole, I think, fourth chapter, I'm already forgetting, um, whole fourth chapter is about basically the fights that people have about women's hairstyles and how that's connected to debates about the women's rights movement um, in, in the middle decades of the 19th century. So, so your response to that question and, and also um, some of the, the writing that you have uh, in, in the chapter about race and, and um, Frederick Douglass's efforts to, mm -hmm. to, to basically create portraiture as much as possible. Um, yeah. it, made me wonder if there's something more to be said about the, the kind of performative or public facing aspect of, of phrenology and physiognomy uh, in, in, the, in the kind of popular imagination. And I was wondering if you, I know you talk a little bit about journaling in the book as well, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, whether or not uh, the, the kind of power or, or kind of staying power, I guess, of these really has to do with its kind of performative outward expression, or if there's more to be said about it as kind of a, a method of internal reflection, uh, if, if you found any kind of evidence to that effect uh, in doing research for this book. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's both a form of social performance and also a method of internal reflection. Um, I have this, this is not really what you asked about performance, but I just love the source and I didn't even write about it in the book. Um, but there's this source of a Mormon man in Utah uh, in the 19th century who it basically keeps like detailed diaries about which phrenological um, faculties he is um, trying to cultivate at a particular moment. And he gives details about like how he's trying to improve certain aspects. Like he wants to improve his faculty of language, for instance. So he goes out into the woods and he just like screams for like a half hour every morning because he thinks that this is going to improve his faculty of language. So for him, it, it really is this method of, of improvement. Um, but also I think for someone like Frederick Douglass, I think Frederick Douglass is is really kind of skeptical of both physiognomy and phrenology, even as he sees them as potentially useful. Um, because Frederick Douglass knows that people are using these disciplines to um, evaluate the intelligence, character, and personality of Black Americans. Like he, he just, he knows that this is the intellectual world that he is working in. And he also thinks that he has and does have a particularly impressive face, right? So Frederick Douglass becomes the most photographed man, uh, American man of the 19th century, um, because he believes that like, you know, white artists, what white artists are doing is they're drawing black faces in these really stereotypical ways and they're exaggerating um, features of, um, uh, of intellectual inf inferiority when they do it. And he's like, you know, photographs though, you can't really exaggerate a photograph. We all know <laughs> that's not entirely true, but for him, he sees photographs as like um, a way of, of portraying like, this is actually what black faces look like. Like if, as long as we take pictures of black faces that do indicate intellect and superiority and, um, and all of these like high moral characteristics, then we can, we can essentially teach the American public to read black faces differently. I think he has a little bit too much hope in this. And I think even he realizes, you know, by the 1860s that he's maybe put a little bit too much hope in the power of pictures to change people's minds. Um, but at the same time, he really does see, um, it's not so much that he's like doing anything in terms of performance, but he does see, he knows that people are going to be reading his face. And so he's, he's, um, he's conveying himself in a, in a very particular manner as a result. Thanks. Um, several questions here about more contemporary resonances with the mm -hmm. history. Um, so, so one, uh, specifically about uh, any connections between history of phrenology and 20th century IQ tests. Um, so kind of going back back to, to this question of the longer legacies uh, and, and how they relate to eugenics and onward. Um, and I think you talk about that in the, in the book too, about facial recognition uh, and, and the connections there with kind of criminality and, and, and those mm -hmm. arguments. Um, so so that's, that's one point. Um, but then also about... Um, you know, how, let me, let me actually read this. So, so um, what do you think people will be saying about the perhaps odd ways uh, of explaining disparities that we see in 2023 um, regarding the present disproportional representation of women in STEM fields, pay gaps, and abilities to make decisions, decisions over their own bodies. So on the one hand, a question about um, relationships with IQ and intelligence, and then another about um, gender and, and perceptions of gender. Yeah, so to take that first question first, so Francis Galton um, is basically the kind of founder of eugenics. He's also an avid um, physiognomist. 
Uh, so Francis Galton is convinced that genius, criminality, um, certain personality traits have clear manifestations in the face. Um, and so he wants to, and he's also obsessed with photography. So he wants to find a way to figure out like, what does the criminal face look like? Like, what are the common features of the criminal face? What are the common features of the musical genius? What are the common features of the philosopher? Um, and so what Francis Galton does is he takes a bunch of photographs and basically like superimposes them of different people who he considers to be geniuses or he considers to be criminals, right? Um, and he superimposes them to try and figure out like, what are the common features of those faces? And he is essentially the father of eugenics and eugenics is like um at least the assumptions of eugenics are, are where iq tests emerge from in, in the first place right so um all of these things are connected and, it, and what's really funny to me is that like as the science advances um increasingly advances and by advances i actually don't think it's much more advanced like i don't think eugenics is more advanced than phrenology but eugenicists thought they were more advanced than phrenologists um and so as the science advances they repeatedly will look back at phrenology and physiognomy and say like, oh, they were so silly in the 1850s or 1840s, they believed this, but we've found a way to do it much more um, in a much more scientifically advanced way, right? So um, the crani uh, craniometrists of, of the 1840s and 50s believe that they're more advanced than the phrenologists, but in reality, they're just building off of a lot of phrenological foundations. So it's like the ideas stick around, but scientists are at every stage convinced that they're doing better than the people who came for them. Um, and I think that's a kind of dangerous, it's a dangerous assumption because um, you always assume that you're living in the most advanced moment of history. Um, and scientists often assume. Um, and there's this idea, I think that circulates not among all scientists, but it does circulate within science that like, there's almost a cumulative nom uh, knowledge um, accumulation, right? So like you always know more and you always know better than the people in the past. And I think as historians, we're much more comfortable embracing this idea that like, sometimes you go forward, sometimes you go backwards, sometimes you're doing both at the same time and, and different historical moments just, just have different assumptions about the world. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, these are all the um, people doing IQ tests, people doing eugenics um, are all kind of building on on these ideas and even measuring facial angles, right? Like even um, analyzing heads and faces explicitly. In terms of um, gender and science, I mean, I think this is a kind of, maybe not the question you asked, but um, something that fascinates me I often will wonder, I'll listen to like pop psychology podcasts, you know, about assumptions that we make um, and the research methods of, of um, certain fields. And I often find myself wondering, okay, this sounds legitimate to me now, but what, which of these scientific assumptions about gender are we gonna look back at in 50 years and see and think are like, oh, wow, that was a little misguided, right? And, and there will, undoubtedly be things that we believe to be true now that um, that in 50 years we'll think of as silly or, or stupid or misguided, yeah. So we're very quickly running out of time. So I, I think I'll, I'll end with, with a, a final question, kind of thinking about the contemporary relevance of this. And, and also to, to go back to, to, I think, the major argument of your book, mm -hmm. which is, is uh, what is lost in thinking about these as pseudosciences. So, yeah. so I, I guess just to end then, I'll ask, how can we use a topic like the history of phrenology and physiognomy, um, not only to kind of rethink about the impact of these so-called pseudosciences, but how we think about present day debates about public trust in science is, mm -hmm. can we use this in a productive way to, to kind of um, reinterrogate those debates um, to, to kind of get out of these, you know, science versus something else uh, discourses that seem to uh, be pervasive in today's uh, media and news outlets. Yeah, I mean, so when we have this huge conflict over vaccines, right, um, and, and in a lot of progressive communities, you saw those signs, it's like, in this house, we believe that, you know, um, no human is illegal, and that Black Lives Matter, and that love is love, and that science is real. Um, and, and there's a way in which I sort of, like, sympathize with those messages, because I'm like, yeah, I do really care about equity, you know, like, I, I really kind of, and I do believe people should get vaccinated, and I do believe the evidence, you know, points to the fact that vaccinations and asking like help and, and prevent the spread of disease. And yet I was so troubled, so troubled by the just like very simple science is real, <laughs> you know, um, because science, just like history and just like any other discipline is a fundamentally constructed discipline. Science is, is a tool, a way of viewing the world, a way of, of studying the world. And you are going to, 
um, it's not perfect because human beings are not perfect and, and, and human beings are flawed. And so the, even like the questions, the scientific questions that we choose to ask, the types of experiments that we choose to design, um, the ways in which we formulate those experiments or, or the things, the factors that we don't think about because they simply just seem like they're not important to us. Human behavior, human bias infiltrates scientific experimentation, um, sometimes in subtle ways and sometimes in, in quite obvious ways. And science has not always been a force for good in the world. I mean, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, we were repeatedly given the message that you should trust the science. But like, as people of color know within um, this country, like they can't always trust the science. Um, it's been like a, this perennial struggle for me to balance my fundamental skepticism of any discipline that claims like, oh, we have found the truth. We have found found the knowledge um and not that science itself is like a, a discipline like I know a lot of scientists are like much more nuanced thinkers than this um but it's been hard to balance my skepticism with like also my faith that like science leads to path-breaking discoveries and um technologies that fundamentally transform the world in which we live in a positive way right um and so I think like what I've come down with is that like ultimately we just got to be humble and like we've got to say like most of the evidence shows us this we actually might be wrong you know like we might be wrong about certain things and that's okay because to be human is to try to fail and to try again, right? Um, and so I'm going to trust what I think the preponderance of evidence tells me um, and know that like that evidence is never going to be perfect or unproblematic. And all the more reasons to write more histories about sciences that yeah. we think have been debunked. So uh, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you everyone sure. for attending. Um, if you haven't already gotten the link to purchase the book, please do, because it's really a great read and has a lot of important messages to tell. Um, I'll see you all hopefully tomorrow, Rachel, and hope to see you back in Philadelphia before long. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having all me. Right. Take this care, everyone. Fun.